O oh God, your beloved son Jesus taught us to keep all your commandments by loving you and our neighbor. Grant us the grace of your Holy Spirit that we may be devoted to you with our whole heart and united to one another in the love with which you love us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Jesus said, first say, peace to this house. Say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. We live in a world of sound bites and memes, don't we? And whatever those other things are that are identified by letters only. Our slogans are on display everywhere, on t-shirts and buttons, billboards, pop-up ads on our laptops and phones, yard signs, on flags and posters, both homemade and professionally printed, on refrigerator magnets and bumper stickers. I'm sure you can think of some other places they are. Some even go so far as to hire small planes to tow banners in the sky above beaches crowded with families seeking summer fun in the sun. They are everywhere. And as mnemonic devices, that is aids to memory, as they go, they can be quite effective. Otherwise, the advertising industry, educators, politicians, and parents alike wouldn't waste the time or the materials or the breath to create whole messaging campaigns. I still recall the mantras and mottos that my parents repeated decades ago some inherited from their parents. Hunger is good sauce, that's my Irish grandfather. Any job worth doing is worth doing well, that's my father, but I think it's actually the telephone company. <laughs> a clear conscience yields a good night's sleep, also the Irish grandfather. If you can't think of anything nice to say, don't say anything, that's my grandmother. Recently, I found my safe re self recalling Roy G. Biv, R O Y G B I V, the order of the colors from outer arc to inner arc in a rainbow. Who knows where that came from or why I remembered it in spring 2022? I couldn't believe it. In both the reading from the letter to the Galatians and Luke's gospel portion for today, the Apostle Paul, and our Lord via the evangelist, helpfully provide us with good news sound bites, simple statements of the essence of the gospel that you and I can probably remember even when we're feeling a tad tongue-tied or uncertain of the message we have been given to proclaim. As members of the Domestic and Foreign Missionary Society, the legal title of the Episcopal Church in the United States of America, each of us has a commission to proclaim by word and deed the good news of God in Christ. And we promise to do just that every time we renew our baptismal covenant. I think many of us, if not most of us, are more comfortable with proclamation by deed than we might be about the word part of our promise. After all, how often have we heard Deeds speak louder than words. When Jesus sends out the 70 disciples as his advance teams, going two by two to every town and place where he himself intended to go, he gives them some guidelines about equipment and behavior and conveys the urgency of their mission. No dawdling, no overpacking. Travel light and keep moving until you stop in a place where the exchange of peace is reciprocated. It is not for nothing, I think, that a standard greeting for centuries in the Middle East has been Shalom Aleichem, or in Arabic, Salam Aleichem. Jesus directs his followers to observe the customary traditions and niceties. Peace be upon this house. After all, the message and mission that they carry is not intended as an offense or a judgment, especially since 
they are going to be dependent upon the hospitality that they find. They are to receive with thanks what they're offered to eat or drink, even, it is, even if it is something to which they are unaccustomed. And they are not to move from house to house in search of better accommodations, you know, softer mattresses or food, mom's home cooking. I grew up in a small fundamentalist congregation in southeastern Pennsylvania that supported several missionaries in other countries, notably in the Caribbean and in Africa. And I hesitate to say that they always carried out their work in unfamiliar places with the same sort of attitude of willingness to adapt to the local culture, especially in terms of diet and housing. It was often referred to pejoratively as going native. Instead, I think there was often an undercurrent of cultural superiority, and that's not surprising. Most human beings are more comfortable and less anxious when familiar food and accommodation is on offer. How else to explain Holiday Inn and the many chain restaurants? You know what to expect. <clears throat> we don't have to think very hard or pay close attention to the customs of the people standing right in front of us. Now, clearly, the 70 disciples are not sent to towns and villages that are radically different from what they already know unless they end up in a community of Samaritans. But Luke writes this story not only as a recounting of past events, but also as a piece of instruction or exhortation for the Christian communities of his day in the latter part of the first century. Communities that were spread around the Mediterranean basin and included many different cultures and languages. One of the things that I always did when serving two of my parishes that had substantial ethnic or racial minorities was to eat the food and to encourage others to do likewise, even and especially my kids. For example, when I would visit members of the Liberian community at St. Matthew's, the last parish I served for almost 20 years, when I visit them in their homes where the cuisine was not modified for American palates, I learned to eat food items that may not have appealed to my taste, but my hosts offered to share their meal with me, and I knew that they worked hard for their bread. Peace be upon this house isn't just words, it's also deeds. Even eating a meal, as my teen teenage son always called it, even eating foreign food. Then they do the work. Jesus' followers are to cure the sick, which they did by prayer and care, and announce the reign of God has come near to you. In the Gospels, healing and exorcisms are all considered signs of the presence of the kingdom of God. Why do we hear so many of them? Because they are important signs of God's reign now. <clears throat> You and I may protest that we are not qualified or credentialed or licensed. We can't do this in our culture or in our time. But friends, there is more than one kind of healing. And some are certainly near at hand to all of us. A lonely person may just need someone to listen to them. Some others may need, after careful listening, a suggestion or a referral or an invitation to go and find what it is they might be in need of. A close friend and colleague of mine has just concluded a seven-year street ministry in the second largest city in New England. Any guesses as to where that is? Worcester, Massachusetts, okay. <clears throat> In any event, she finished that ministry just recently. Much of her work was listening to people, bringing water bottles with her on hot days, warm gloves and hats in the, in the winter, goodie bags of personal hygiene items and nutrition bars, and making connections 
ESL classes for new immigrants held in the drop-in center pre-COVID, getting people who wanted to get clean and sober a bed in rehab, or a connection to AA and NA groups in the city, being trained to administer Narcan, that's healing, <laughs> and getting to know the people of her neighborhood, which turned out to be a shooting gallery at times. As we celebrated the conclusion of this ministry a few weeks ago, someone asked her why the ministry was not continuing beyond her retirement. And she replied that if she was starting this ministry now in 2022, it would be located in a different neighborhood of the city. As during the course of the pandemic, the process of gentrification began to reach her neighborhood and the people her ministry served found elsewhere in that city. The street ministry that she did was no longer as welcome where it began, though she did not stand in the middle of Main Street and shout, I'm shaking the dust off my shoes, but know this, the reign of God has here. No, she didn't do that. It's not about rejection of the messenger, though you and I sometimes take it personally, but rather about a reluctance or inability or just bad timing to hear the message of mercy and the new creation. After all, even in the gospels, Jesus's message isn't always received as such great good news by everyone. His ministry reveals that to us. But if you and I are willing to travel light, we might be able to respond more quickly to emerging mission opportunities, finding other places to announce the good news that the reign of God has come near. When the 70 return with joy, they bring reports of mission successes. We're fascinated by success. There always should be success. But Jesus is quick to put that all in perspective. Listen, I saw Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. He urges them to find their joy elsewhere, not in the memory of the extraordinary acts to which they bear witness, but instead in the assurance of their place in the abiding and eternal love of God, that their names are written in heaven in the everlasting register of God's people, an ever-expanding register. Not only has the reign of God drawn near, but they are indeed citizens of that kingdom. Or as the Apostle Paul writes, they are members of the body of the crucified and resurrected Christ, the new creation. Indeed, the closing lines of Paul's letter to our brothers and sisters in Galatia, which we heard read today, are the joyous declaration that God's new creation is everything, everything, absolutely everything. Though in Paul's large letters or script, the Greek syntax is incomplete, conveying Paul's great excitement with, about the reality that the resurrection of Jesus has initiated. For neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything. Neither category has meaning any longer, but a new creation. And that's how it is in the Greek. Just that. No connecting words, no nothing. But a new creation. Words run out for Paul who is normally never at a loss for words and often needs a better editor. What a statement of wonder and awe. New creation. That's the message of Easter. New creation. He will use these words again in another letter, but Paul writes them here first. And for those who take these words to heart, well, in another broken syntax, peace and mercy be upon them. That's you and me taking these words to heart. What then shall you and I do and say as we try to live out our baptismal covenant and our membership in a part of Christ's body that named itself a missionary society almost 200 years ago? 
I think the words our Lord gave the 70 disciples that he sent ahead of him as he traveled towards Jerusalem and the cross are helpful reminders for our mission task. Bid the peace of God in some manner to all whom we meet in every context in which we encounter our neighbors. Intentionally and even occasionally with words. As though we really know ourselves to be agents of that peace in a world that sorely needs it. When someone asks why we do what we do as we work for justice and peace and practice works of compassion and mercy, respond. That's just not an idle question or rhetorical. They want an answer, otherwise they wouldn't ask. Respond with simple statements of faith and trust. You don't have to be a theologian to do this or even a Bible scholar. Bear witness that God's reign is near, even now, even here. That's why we do it. Not because it makes us feel good, but because it's part of this mission to which we have been committed. If God's people lose heart as we subvert, survey conflict and division, injustice, and the profound lack of mercy and compassion, how will we ever proclaim and live the good news? Sometimes, like the preacher who has only one sermon to preach, the one that she or he most needs to hear, we too need to hear these words. To point out the places where we see the reign of God drawing near, in small acts of healing that are not small at all, in works of justice and mercy, that are part of that long, long arc of which Martin Luther King spoke. And as Paul announced, much to his surprise, daily and joyful faithfulness to living as new creation, open to wonder and the amazing grace of God's great love for all in this precious world, every moment of every day. Peace be with you. God's reign is very near. New creation. Maybe we need some more refrigerator magnets. Amen.